The model view controller is probably one of the most commonly used patterns in the world. In fact, you probably use programs that apply this pattern every single day of your life. But what exactly is it and why is it so widely used? The typical use case for this pattern are programs with user interfaces such as websites and mobile apps. And the pattern says that the underlying code of these programs can be split into three separate components. Models, views and controllers. Views are what the user actually sees and interacts with, such as web pages and clicking links on the web page. The model describes actual objects of the application and any code that needs to be associated with them. For example, in the case of YouTube, a video and a YouTube channel would both be considered models. And then finally, the controller is basically the middleman between the view and the model, which basically translates interactions with the view into actions performed by the model. And then typically, it will respond to the view with whatever's been done by the model. And the reason why this pattern is used is for the separation of concerns. In other words, it's a way to separate your software components into parts that only do a single thing. So the view represents the user interface, the model represents the data, and the controller handles the interactions between them, and when this is all separated, it allows you to have a very clean code base. But if they were all together, then it would just be quite the mess. So as an example, let's take a look at what might happen when you click on a video on YouTube. So first of all, the view would send a request to the video controller saying which video you just clicked on. The video controller would then ask the video model for information about that exact video, for example, the title, the description, and the video itself. The model would then send this information back to the controller, of which would then render the view. Now that we hopefully understand what model view controller is, let's create a very small part of a website which utilises this pattern. In this case, we're going to be creating a login system for a website called Bloggy, where Bloggy is just a very simple blogging website where users will be able to make posts and then other users will be able to view and then comment on them. And from this, we can see that Bloggy would have at least three entities, which would be posts, comments and users all of which would have their own individual model and controller as well as multiple views. But as for only making a login system for Bloggy, the only part of this we need to actually worry about are the users. And this just means creating a few files, one for the user model, one for the user controller, and then multiple for the user views. And there's also going to be a couple of additional files for the homepage, like the homepage controller and the homepage view, which in this case is just index.ejs. But how exactly does this all actually fit together? Let's take a look. The first thing that will happen when the user enters the website is they'll be taken to the home page. But how this works on the MVC pattern is a little bit more different than just serving them the home page. As this is a website, the first thing it will do is look at the web address and recognise where the user is. It will then select an appropriate controller to use based on the web address. In this case, there's nothing actually there, so it's just going to use the home controller. And then finally, the home controller will render the home page, making it visible to the user. That might seem weirdly complicated for something as simple as serving the home page, so let's actually look at a different example, like the user signing up to the website. The first thing that's going to happen is the user is going to click on the button that takes them to the sign up page. In this case, it's an anchor element which takes them to the page users sign up. Like with the home page, it's going to look at the web address and select the appropriate controller based on that. In this case, it's going to select the users controller as that is the first part of the address. Inside of the users controller, it's going to look at the web address again and then select the appropriate action based on this. In this case, it is get sign up, so it's going to select that action, which was just going to render the sign up page. On this page, the user is going to enter their details into a form and then press the sign up button. This page where the user is entering their details will be part of the user views. In this case, they're entering information into a form which has the action of users sign up, only this time it's a post request rather than a get request. As you've probably already worked out, this is going to end up using the user's controller again, only this time it's going to be using this action instead because it's a post request for users sign up. Unlike the other actions that we've looked at so far, this one actually deals with some data, and so it's going to be using the user's model to actually deal with the data. As this is the data for the user signing up to the website, the first thing it's going to do is check if a user with that email address already exists, and if they do not, then it will actually create the user. In both cases of this, checking if the user exists and also creating the user, it's going to be using the user model. And this is the sort of thing that the models are exactly for. It sort of acts as an interface between the controllers and the actual database. 
And that's what's happening in the two functions here. It's literally just doing a quick query to the database and then returning the result back to the controller, which then redirects the user back to the home page, only this time it's welcoming the user to the website. So anyways, to quickly recap on that, first of all, the user entered their data into a form, and when they press submit, it sent that data to the user's controller. And then the user's controller queried the user model to create the new user. And then finally, the user controller just rendered the home page. To reiterate, the view is what the user interacted with. The controller then sent that data to the model. And then finally, the model actually did something with that data, in this case, created the user. The user, of course, will also be able to log out and then log back in again. But as a challenge, I'll leave that to you to figure out how that works using the MVC pattern. Eventually, Bloggy will also allow you to view the posts that other people have made as well as the posts that you have made right there on the homepage. But how does that work? As a final example of the MVC pattern, let's have a look. Exactly the same as before, it's going to look at the web address and recognise to use the home controller and then recognise to use the action that gets the home page. Only this time the implementation is just a bit different, because this time it's making a call to the post model to get all of the posts that people have made, where a post is just another name for a blog. Inside of the post model, the all function gets all the posts in the database and then loops through them all, attaching the user to them. And this is because, as you can see on the left there, the posts themselves only store the ID of the user rather than the entire user. And this is because, for example, if the user changes their name, then the resultant data of the posts will still be accurate. So then finally, the posts are then returned back to the home controller as sort of a JSON structure that looks something like this, of which contains all of the information needed about the blog posts to actually render them onto the views. So the main idea of MVC is that the models, views, and controllers are split, which itself will lead to many advantages. For example, one developer could be working on the views, and another one could be working on the models, and they would be completely unaffected by each other because these two parts of the code would be completely separated, which itself would lead to faster development of an application. Furthermore, this split allows the code to be very loosely coupled. This means that software components have very little knowledge about other components in the code, which allows for very easy modification of one piece of code without breaking other pieces of the code base. Unfortunately, the MVC model does not come without its disadvantages as well. First of all, the amount of files needed to get anything done is quite large, which makes this model quite unsuitable for smaller projects. This also has a side effect that the code navigation becomes quite difficult. This is because of so many files and so much code that finding something very specific might take a little while. And finally, in order to actually use the NVC pattern, you need quite a bit of prior knowledge of other technologies in order to actually use it effectively. For example, even in the case of a simple website, you're going to need to know quite a bit about HTTP, amongst other things such as databases, HTML, CSS, and sometimes maybe even JavaScript. But saying that, many NVC frameworks such as Ruby and Rails have things like code generation. For example, with a simple command, you're able to generate models, views, and controllers. And furthermore, things like modern text editors have very good search functionality, which makes quite a lot of these disadvantages not so big of a deal. So overall, I think the advantages definitely do weigh out the disadvantages, making the MVC model a very solid pattern to use for a large number of applications. So anyway, quick shout out to my patrons, thank you Killer Crazy Man, Hayden, Timothy Gibbons, Timo Schrader, Alan Fernandez, Michael Kirsch, Lucas Durenberger, Neil Blakely Milner and Nate Brown, thank you very much for all your support. So anyways, once again thank you for watching and I'll see you all next time.